the future of work. We did financial reform. We're about to do food next month and climate. And today we're doing um, democracy and corporate power and inequality. And so part of the purpose of this space has been to try to connect across those issues and think really structurally and systemically about how these kinds of issues are related to an overall political and economic system. Um, and another, you know, any convening is an opportunity to just to get to know one another better, to build relationships, and to get plugged in. Um, so we hope that if you're not already plugged in to this conversation, um, you might join the New Economy Funders Network or the Edge Funder Alliance or an affinity group where these conversations are continuing in an ongoing way. Um, but so each segment in this series has been organized by a different funder, funder group. And so I just want to thank uh, the FCCP, the Funders Collaborative on Civic Participation, and Alex Russell for her help organizing this. Um, Cavalman Group was very helpful. OSF, the Piper Fund, the Sustainability Funders Network, the Sister Fund, and the Edge Funder Alliance. And Sarah Stranahan for holding it down as well. Um, and now we're going to turn it over to a short film that the Edge Funder Alliance and Sister Fund helped make um, to kind of create, set the framing. There's a lot of talk about the economy these days. Some people say the economy is taking up. Some people say it's tanking. If you really want to make sense of the economy, it's useful to take a big step back and ask yourself, what does economy really mean? But the heart is this tiny little word, eco. And eco means home. Ecosystem is all of the complex relationships of home. Ecology is the knowledge or study of home. And then you get economy. Economy is simply the management of home. So there are three basic pillars that are true for all economies. You need resources. You need land, air, water. You need the living world around you. The second pillar is you need work. You need labor to combine with those resources to produce stuff. And then you need a culture, a cosmology, a worldview that tells us what we can do with our labor towards what ends with the world around us. Then what are the pillars of the dominant economy, the economy that's all around us right now? Well, we get our resources through extraction. We forcefully remove them from the earth. We get our labor through exploitation. Resources and labor have to be acquired at the lowest possible price. And the culture is one in which we can have endless and infinite growth that denies the real ecological and social consequences towards one very particular end. The accumulation of greater and greater monetary wealth and power. The big corporations are being governed really for the benefit of their CEO. It's not even for the shareholders anymore. The same way that the basis of modern production is extraction from the planet, modern finance is extraction from a larger community towards the financial community towards 1%. This is not only an economic issue about who's getting money, it's also a racial issue, it's also a class issue. This economy often leaves out people of color, immigrants, minority communities, women. So the question is, if the extractive economy is what got us into the mess we're in right now, can it get us out? Not likely. What is required is fundamentally to transform, to transform the way things are structured. The depth to which corporations are integrated into economies around the world. Meaning, we absolutely have to say at the global level, the international level, we need to explore new ways of managing home. The new economy has to step away and then push back at those old pillars because it has to be a new economy that puts people before profit, that puts planet before profit. The first pillar is to rethink our relationship to resources. There's simply no way that we can have this endless, limitless, infinite growth on what is, I think, obviously a finite planet. The second pillar has to replace the exploitation of human labor with a recognition that when we take our labor and apply it towards economic well-being, we can create a new cycle that's based on regeneration. That requires a new theory a new way of imagining our relationship to each other and to home. 
It's not only really possible, it's happening all around us. One of the most inspiring things is that there are people, groups, all over the country and the world who are organizing both to meet people's needs and actually confront the systems that are underneath the crisis. Underlying all of it is a small democracy. I think it could actually change the way things are going to have people actually participating in the decisions that are governing their lives. Any economic transition has to have this notion of restructuring the way we think about ownership. That demands some political muscle, some organizing muscle, and some ideal muscle. How do we develop new business models that create more local ownership and more democratic ownership? Even philanthropy is looking to change. The greatest task philanthropy has is not simply to give to what exists, but to reimagine what is possible. The most basic thing we're talking about is human consciousness. We're not in the sense of self-awareness, in the sense of how we behave, how we think, how we understand the world we're and how we form relationships. And the extent that we start transforming those understandings and those relationships, that's part of forming the new economy today, here and now. By looking at how we live, we can find how we can live better, more interconnected lives. And simultaneously invest in and build the economy we know we need. And maybe we can be happier for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah, for that wonderful framing of this program um, and that inspiring film. I haven't seen it before. I'd like to watch it again um, and again and again because it's nice and short. <laughs> I'm Alison Barlow. I direct the Democracy and Media programs at the Wallace Global Fund. Um, and I'm very honored to be invited to moderate this session. We have three fantastic speakers. Um, one of whom is on her way. Uh, um, and I'll introduce our, uh, our panelists in just a moment. I just want to tell you a little bit about the Wallace Global Fund, because I think it speaks to the theme of today's program, Inequality, Democracy, and Corporate Power. Um, our work reflects the vision and legacy of Henry Wallace, who was the 33rd Vice President of the United States. He was an advocate for empowering people globally. And he was also a voice on the threat to democracy posed by the rise of the corporate state. So here we are now, you know, in the century after he spoke, um, 21st century, he was so important to the 20th century. And, you know, we see this intersection of the degradation of democracy, distortion of our global and domestic economy, and then, of course, the destruction of the environment. And, um, this is an exciting weekend with the climate march, the climate events next week. Jay, you can take your button back out if you'd like. Uh, we'll all be there. And some of our signature initiatives focus on these issues. I'd be happy to talk with you about our Divest Invest from Fossil Fuels initiative later um, if anyone's interested. But focusing back on what we are, we are going to talk about today, you know, I ran across a headline from a Mother Jones, Andy Kroll, wrote just today the, the five signs that the dark money apocalypse is upon us. And that, I love, you know, talking about the apocalypse with funders. Um, spend, it, and I won't go through the five signs, but I will note that spending in these midterm elections apparently will, could surpass spending in the 2012 presidential. That's extraordinary. It's outrageous. And it's linked to these issues of kind of the fundamental problems facing our democracy, facing us through the rise of inequality. And it, a lot of it does come back to the challenge of reigning in corporate power. So here to talk with us today about these themes are three fabulous speakers. And I'll introduce the first two. And then um, when Julia comes, we'll, we'll meet her later. She's scheduled to be our third speaker, so it's OK. Um, First, we'll hear from Jeff Clements. He is the author of this book, Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations. Um, he's also the founder and chair of the board, uh, co-founder, I might say, with John Boniface, who's here as well, uh, Free Speech for People. 
and um, which was founded after the Citizens United decision came down. Um, there's an event after this gathering for Jeff and the book, so you're all invited to stay for that. And then our second speaker will be Heather McGee, who is president of DEMOS, a public policy organization based here in New York that focuses on issues around democracy and inequality in the, the economy. And so she is in deep on all of these themes. Um, just before we ask Jeff to start, I wonder if we could go around very, very quickly and introduce ourselves just with our names and organizations so we'll all know who we're talking to. And um, when we have a discussion later, I still won't be able to call on you by name because I'm not wearing my new glasses. Uh, but, but we'll, we'll get okay. to that. And Julia. Yes, yay. Um, All right. Our third speaker has arrived. I'm going to introduce you now, Julia, but you don't have to talk till later. Um, <laughs> Julia Hose is from St. Louis, Missouri, and she's an organizer with Missourians Organizing for Reform and Empowerment, also known as MORE. This organization works on a number of important intersecting issues around fossil fuel corporations, investment in green job creation, racial justice, and many more. So a little later, we'll hear about how some of the issues that Jeff and um, Heather will speak of at kind of the national and policy levels are really playing out on the ground. So thank you and welcome. Thank Please you. have some water. <laughs> um, so would you mind just starting with a quick introduction of your name and organization? Sure. I'm Angelique Darby-Sinema, and I'm with Association for Women's Rights and Development, as well as the Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so um, we have a nice amount of time, and we're going to kind of dive in and ask Jeff, how do we pull back from the apocalypse? <laughs> well, after that inspiring video, I'm sorry to uh, take you down into the apocalypse, um, which is upon us. Um, no, I, I, I have three points. The first two are apocalyptic. The last, I think, is um, very, I think, encouraging um, and exciting. And essentially what I'd like to do is sort of set the table a bit with um, a discussion of Citizens United um, and, and how we, at least at Free Speech for People, view it, and I think many now across the country view it, um, and um, the real world impacts quick overview of those. And then finally, the um, great opportunity, as I see it, if we put this um, situation into the context of constitutional struggle, um, as I call it, um, which essentially means the fight for political equality that we've had since 1776, and which has been the driver for every single advance in this country, in my view. Um, and uh, so let me dive in with that. Um, so Citizens United, I won't get into the details of the case, I think everybody knows it, but essentially it brought together two um, somewhat toxic fabrications of our of constitutional doctrine. One is the well-known money is speech, the campaign finance problem, um, essentially saying we the people are powerless to limit spending in elections. 
Um, the second is the title of a good book, Corporations Are Not People. They actually held corporations are people. Um, for a while after Citizens United, it was somewhat um, intellectually fashionable in some quarters, including among friends of mine, to say, oh, they never really said anything about corporations. It's about the First Amendment and money. And then we got Hobby Lobby, in which corporations had epiphanies and started getting religion, and 13,000 uh, employees no longer had access to birth control because of the application of corporate constitutional rights. So it's very real. Um, and so, so those are the sort of most some admittedly somewhat crude ways to put what those cases, Citizens United and McCutcheon and then Hobby Lobby and related cases stand for. Um, but I think it's really important that we view them not as simply mistakes of the law or campaign finance cases or, you know, put taking them in their separate um, applications, but seeing them for what they are together, which essentially the common holding is a, is a denial of the most hallowed principle of American life, which is that we're all created equal, um, that we come to elections and political um, engagement and representative government as equals. Uh, the Supreme Court quite literally says, no, that's not true. Five to four, but the five say that's not true. And if you doubt that, look at McCutcheon. Um, in that case, they struck down the aggregate contribution limit of $123,000, um, which is about five times the median wage of Americans. We hear household income of 50000 That's usually two incomes. Um, so $123,000 was the limit. Struck down as a violation of the free speech rights of those who can spend more than $123,000 on politicians. And the brief, the winning argument, and I'm reading from the McCutcheon brief, contribution limits may not be upheld as a means of limiting disparities in the extent to which people of different economic backgrounds are able to participate in the political process and to exercise their own First Amendment rights. Now that argument won, and one of the things that a lawyer should be good at, and uh, I hope I am after all the years I've been doing it, is translate legalese into plain English, and it doesn't take much translation for that one. It essentially means if you can't afford speech or political part participation, tough luck, loser. You're out. <laughs> and increasingly, that's everybody except a very small section of the country and big corporations. So we have a flawed doctrine of money equals speech, which is really, you know, money equals power and concentrated money equals concentrated power, which is the campaign finance dynamic. Um, so, so that's sort of point one is the, the situation we're dealing with. But if we look at point number two I'd make, which is how this actually plays out, why this is more than just constitutional debate or even policy arguments and essentially at the level of, um, you know, existential for democracy constitutional struggle, um, we look at the application of this doctrine of supercharging, you know, superpowered citizens, essentially, big global corporations and billionaires, to the exclusion of most citizens um, in, in a republic. So as I mentioned, we have Hobby Lobby, where the rights of a corporation, for the first time in American history, a business corporation held to have religious freedom, 13,000 employees. This was not a, a small mom and pop business, 13,000 employees lost a right that they had, which is access to health insurance with birth control. They don't have it. They still don't have it to this day, although the court made noises about some accommodations that could be had. Um, the National Labor Relations Board had issued a, a ruling, a law that said in the workplace, employees are entitled to notice of their right to talk about workplace conditions and organize if they chose to do so. Struck down, violation of corporate speech rights. That in that case, the right not to speak. They didn't want to put that sign up, and they won that argument, constitutional argument. In Seattle, I, this one surprised even me, and, and we're litigating the case now. We're joining, joining the fight in Seattle over the minimum wage, which has been challenged in court. The minimum wage extension to $15 an hour has been challenged by corporations as a violation of corporate speech rights, corporate association rights, and corporate equal protection rights under the Constitution. So even the minimum wage, which is barely enough to take care of a family, at, even at the higher number, $15, is claimed to be constitution, unconstitutional in this new world. So and in St. Louis, as Julia knows, um, we tried to help out in a case in which 30,000 St. Louis citizens signed 
lawfully to put on the ballot a question of whether they get to vote on their tax dollars being extracted from them and given to Peabody Energy as a subsidy. Um, Peabody funded a lawsuit to challenge that as a violation of corporate rights, even the vote on it, let alone the, the, the changing of the, of the subsidy. Uh, there will not be a vote. Peabody won. The citizens of St. Louis are not allowed to vote on whether their tax dollars will be used to subsidize fossil fuel corporations. That was sort of bringing the two together, these two problems. They, they won in court, the corporations, and then they also won a special law in the legislature at the snap of their fingers. The legislature in Missouri passed a law that said, essentially a special law that only applied to Peabody Coal and only applied to St. Louis and said you're not allowed to have a municipal referendum on tax subsidies. Um, so it kind of brought the political corruption problem together with the corporate power problem. So I could go on, but you probably could too. Um, we, these are a, a very dangerous situation. We can't just um, look at policy solutions much, and there's some very, very good ones. But if we look at this as a constitutional struggle that we must win, we not only build the movement that can drive the policy changes, um, but we catalyze uh, a whole bunch of new ideas and new economy ideas that otherwise are very difficult to, to move forward in this environment. So we're bringing together to um, win this constitutional struggle of political equality, to put say, well, actually, the court, you're wrong. Political equality is a value. It's always been a value. Um, and, and the way we're going to win it is with a constitutional amendment campaign and a legal advocacy program in the courts. So we win the legal argument. We build with our legal advisory committee and the kind of cases we're doing and a conference at Harvard Law School that we're doing. And we'll do this at other law schools on the new jurisprudence for the new economy and the, and the political equality um, that we are entitled to. But the constitutional amendment campaign is a very important um, uh, sort of uh, movement to go along with this because it invites everybody into this debate. And that's, a, that's where we win it. Um, and we are winning it. You may have seen the 55 senators who co-sponsored the Democracy for All Amendment. It's something that um, we were told, oh, you'll, nev you'll never get in our lifetime, a vote on the Senate floor. <laughs> we got it already. We won 55-42. In this world, of course, you know 55 doesn't win anything, so we didn't win the amendment yet. We do need 67 votes, but this was never an inside Washington, and we'll be back for, to, for that win. Um, we have 16 states that have passed resolutions, 600 cities and towns, and I could go into a lot more detail, but I'm going to run out of my time. Um, but the, um, the, point, the point is, I think the country recognizes um, beyond any policy or political or even economic disagreements we might have, the fundamental principle that we have is how, you know, when the court said women don't have a right to vote, when the court said we can't have a progressive income tax in this country, that's unconstitutional. When the court said it's okay to uh, enslave some people, it's okay to deprive the vote of some people, every time we've had a constitutional amendment and work in the courts and doing and 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 putting into the this this these struggles into the context of the we the people who the constitution is for struggling um, not only for a policy or a better uh, world but essentially for justice and and what we promised ourselves as Americans. So I think if we can put it in that context, we'll really drive forward quickly. Um, all the other work and, and it will come together um, as one larger movement and we will win the constitutional argument um, and I am confident in our lifetime Citizens United will be overturned and maybe a lot sooner than we think. So thanks. That's the silver line. All right. <laughs> Jeff, thank you for that silver lining um, and you know the recognition that it can take some time but it is also moving along I think quick, more quickly than anyone anticipated um, when some of these decisions initially came down. So uh, this kind of the issues of political inequality and the constitutional uh, framework that, you know, and the changes that we've seen that you discussed are met, um, you know, very real, in a very real way with the kind of economic inequality and the disruption of democracy that we're experiencing now. And, and Heather, I wonder if you want to talk about how that you see that playing out, and where again, the challenges, but also the opportunities are. Absolutely, great. Thank you. Is this on? I think it is. Great. Um, so thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Julia, Allison, everyone who's pulled together this conversation, Leah. I think it's really, really exciting. Um, 
there aren't that many rooms that in which you can talk about the economy and bring in uh, fundamental issues of democracy um, in this way. And I think it's really wonderful. Um, Demos was founded in 2000 on an analysis around the connection between inequality in our democracy and in our economy. And um, three years ago, we did a strategic planning process that gave us a few different um, sort of insights and directions, and two of them are relevant for this conversation. One, we um, decided that we really needed to elevate the issue of money in politics as um, a structural barrier to many of the other policy goals that we have. Um, and then two, that in addition to the work that we had done on sort of really household economic insecurity and inequality, the rise of debt, uh, stagnant wages, sort of all of the conversation around sort of the um, difficulty of aspiring to the middle class or staying in it, that we needed to have a broader conversation around the paradigm under which all of our economic decisions are made, um, which is sort of the, the new economy uh, conversation. And we actually see these things as all inextricably linked, so it is so fun to be here in a room where that is also the case. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this idea of the next economy and why it is why democracy is so essential to it. Um, we actually had a, a conference earlier this week that was some of the greater practitioners of um, new ideas for economic development that um, are guided by principles that I'll talk about in a moment earlier this week. And what became very clear, um, the Rockefeller Foundation um, hosted it and, and put it on with us. And what became very clear is that democracy is at the core. If you think about um, the principles of a new economy being around sustainability, and it's easy, sometimes it's easier to think of the uh, sort of broken current paradigm and just flip them, right? Just to think of what is that you want in the next one, right? It's it's sustainability, it's racial and gender equity, and it's fundamentally people having control over the decisions that affect their lives to a much greater degree than they do today, and are the people who are making those decisions uh, being much more responsive to the public interest than they are today. And if you get out of the idea that the economy is the weather and some force that we don't control and accept that it's actually guided completely by the rules and decisions that the most powerful players in any ecosystem write, who's writing that rules becomes essential to any question we have about any individual economic policy or outcome. And so I think it is ext an extraordinary gift to our field that a number of political scientists recently that Demos has been working with have started to be able to actually quantify the compound effect of the distortions in our electorate, right? The 20 percentage point voter registration gap between low income and high income households and the distortions in our uh, campaign finance system, right? The fact that less than 1% of Americans gave over $200 or $200 or more in a federal campaign uh, in 20. 2012, uh, the fact that it took just 32 super PAC donors to outspend all of the small donors under $200 to Romney and Obama combined, just 32. So if you look at the distortions in our democracy, both on the money and on the voting side, these political scientists, um, Martin Gillens, uh, Larry Bartels, Benjamin Page, Kay Schlossman, um, have started to be able to actually show us what effect that has on our economic policy. And it's really quite remarkable. Because what happens is because of the outsized influence of organized business and of the wealthy who comprise the donor class, their opinions matter more to elected officials. Shocking. This is what it takes political science, right, to, to, to prove this to us. But why that matters specifically to economic policy is that the divergence in policy preferences from the wealthy to the working and middle class is most acute on issues of economic policy, on the regulation of business, on the importance of deficits versus public investment, on uh, labor protections, on the social safety net, the size of government, higher education, the list goes on. And when that divergence happens, 
Congress sides with the donut class. And that has been uh, a case that is uh, basically a bipartisan um, effect, although Democrats have been in these regression analysis slightly more responsive to the working and middle class. So I want to give just two quick examples of where that policy preference is really shown um, and how, and then I want to talk about what we can do about it. One is um, on the minimum wage, which is uh, obviously an issue that seems to be um, having a lot of momentum right now, mainly because people who are earning the minimum wage are putting that wage uh, at risk by striking and organizing right now across the country. And um, the idea that the minimum wage should be high enough so that someone working full time would be able to keep their family out of poverty is extremely popular with the American public. Right? Over 70% of Americans, including 50% of Republican voters, agree with that proposition. That's why the President could have said that in the State of the Union address, and the dials went up, if you know, watching CNN. But only 40% of the donor class agrees with that proposition. And that's how we could have all plotted at the State of the Union and the minimum wage could still be about 30% lower than it was at its peak in 1968. So when we look at that issue, I think in some ways it is a microcosm of, um, of the urgency of democracy reform. And I want to say this as a challenge to uh, our allies in the democracy movement, that it is really beginning to change. But for a long time, democracy work was seen as sort of a process issue, a good government issue, that didn't have the real life and death struggle that economic justice and racial justice and social justice and environmental justice had. And one of the things that's been so wonderful to hear and see is that phrases like political equality, which really evoke a march towards justice of the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, the emancipation movement, are being talked about when we're talking about campaign finance reform, right? <laughs> when we're talking about the sort of bloodless uh, federal, you know, um, FEC disclosures, right? And it's really, really exciting. Um, I will say that the um, I agree with Jeff that the constitutional change is essential. Demos has been working on a um, on a jurisprudence change project with with Free Speech for People and the Brennan Center. Um, the Open Society Foundations, and it needs to accelerate because I actually don't, I wasn't surprised, Allison, at how quickly momentum has shifted. There, something happened when the Citizens United decision came down. A light bulb went off for people, and I think it was the confluence of the financial crash and that decision and the, you know, ensuing government dysfunction after the 2010 election. People understand for the first time that whether or not there is a foreclosure sign swinging in the front yard of their neighbor has to do with the rules of our democracy and what's happening in Washington. People understand that whether or not they can send their kids to college has to do with how much money for-profit colleges are spending and how many tax cuts are given away to billionaires when they could be being invested in the next generation. That is the political terrain that we are working on, and it is really high political terrain. When we did an analysis of the public opinion about this issue, we ended up calling the report Citizens Actually United, because you can't get below 7 out of 10 support from Tea Party, uh, Tea Party members to you know, Occupy Wall Street uh, followers on the idea that corporations are not people, that there's too much corporate power in Washington, and for the solutions for a constitutional amendment for public financing of campaigns that would allow people to run without large private donations. So I'm very, very optimistic. I think the rate of change on this is going to be much, much faster than even we in the field actually um, commonly operate under the assumption of. So um, I will close there and wait for questions in Julie's presentation. Great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> So excited about the optimism. Mm -hmm. I share it too. And uh, one
one of the things that makes me very optimistic is the incredible work of Julia and her colleagues at Moore. I must say, we um, at the Wallace Global Fund know Moore a little bit through uh, through some of the Peabody work and other other activities, and and I'm just very very excited that we actually have an opportunity to hear about how these themes that Jeff and Heather are playing are talking about that play out at a kind of national policy, constitutional jurisprudential level actually are playing out in very real time and very real ways on issues that we all care about in very important communities in our country. And so Julia, I'm going to ask you to share some comments about um, what you all are doing and seeing in St. Louis. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Um, first, I want to really thank Jeff and Heather. I think that they frame this issue really perfectly and that this is an issue of democracy. Um, and I really agree with, Heather, your definition of sort of what democracy is, is people having the ability to make decisions that affect their lives. And I think um, very concretely to direct the resources that are spent in their community and to be able to have control over those resources, um, whether that's, you know, environmental resources, limited resources, or, you know, money um, in government. So I think first I want to, I want to, you know, run through sort of the structure of what I'm going to, I want to say. Um, First, I want to start with the context of what Moore is, how it how it grew out of Acorn, um, and the context of St. Louis as it relates to corporate power. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the organizing efforts we have. Jeff um, laid out sort of the basics of what Take Back St. Louis was, but also um, the work that we're doing in Ferguson right now. And then last, I want to talk about some very concrete next steps of um, the organizing that we're doing on the ground and how that's leading up in the next month. So. Um, more uh, grew out of basically post-ACORN groups. And we have very much a, um, I would say, very radical agenda in that we want systematic change. Um, we want to take advantage of movement moments like what happened during the 2008 housing crisis um, in occupying what's happening in Ferguson right now. Um, but we did not get to that theory of change overnight. Um, what happened was, for a long time, as an ACORN group, our um, executive director, Jeff Ordauer, was the Midwest director of, of ACORN. Um, and for you know many of you who are familiar with ACORN, their theory of change was very based on incremental change within the system, on getting um, you know, very concrete gains and increasing you know, home ownership in low-income neighborhoods, increasing voter registration. Um, what changed that was really the 2008 housing crisis, and the fact that all of these gains that had been made over 25 years, really significant changes, um, were wiped away, you know, in <laughs> in less than a year, um, and that those things were, you know, at the end of the day, the corporations that were governing that Wall Street had a lot more say um, than these community organizers did, or anything that we could have done at that point. Um, and that really, I think, shifted our agenda very quickly, um, and that more sort of grew out of the ashes of that. Um, and that we wanted to build the left flank of an intersectional movement um, in St. Louis. And that, and now we saw Missouri as a very um, strategic place to begin that organizing and to begin that intersectional organizing, understanding that the crisis of climate change um, and you know all of these all of these crises are overlapping at a very um, alarming rate. Um, so, that sort of, like I said, um, that theory of change really shaped who we are now and that we believed in two main things. The first is that we needed disruption. Um, we needed mass disruption to create a movement. And that was not necessarily in the context of organizations, but in that we're, lead we're lifting up um, the leadership of people of color in that. Um, and the second one is that we were playing an inside-outside game and that we needed to find allies, progressive allies in the St. Louis community who could fight to win um, negotiations at the table with seats of power, um, while we could be, like I said, the left flank of that and causing disruption through direct action and by empowering low and middle income communities. Um, and then in the context of St. Louis, um, you know, I think Jeff's brief story of what happened with Take Back St. Louis was very indicative of sort of who has the power um, in St. Louis and that, you know, for us, the coal corporations are really um, the corporate powers. For a long time, Peabody has been the only Fortune 500 company left in the city of St. Louis. But we also have Anheuser-Busch. Um, we also have, there, there's a Federal Reserve, um, which Peabody is the president of, they're, they're the president of the local Federal Reserve. Um, and they guide our, our policies, our monetary policies. 
Um, there's also Monsanto. Um, Boeing has huge bases of operation. There's uh, about four other coal corporations that kind of run the city. Um, and so for, for most people, the only interactions or the only connotations they have of Peabody Energy are through very elite institutions in the city that are very well connected. So um, I was a student at Washington University. Our board of trustees had executives from Monsanto, from Peabody, from Bank of America, from Boeing, and um, from Patriot Coal, or from Arch Coal. So um, most people understand that Peabody is linked to the Peabody Opera House. They fund the science, they fund a coal, clean coal exhibit in the Science Center. They fund clean coal research on my um, alma mater. They also, um, you know, fund the zoo. The CEO of Peabody is on the, um, on the board of the Children's Hospital. The list goes on and on. Um, and so we were, when choosing to sort of fight Peabody, it was a very intentional decision that actually had nothing to do with climate to begin with. Um, we started funding Peabody because of the tax breaks that were being diverted from the public schools in St. Louis. Um, and in 2011, Peabody was given a $61 million tax break over the course of 10 years um, to build a new gym, to create office renova uh, renovations. Um, they were buying $4,000 chairs and providing zero jobs. And so we really um, went after them within uh, conjunction with a lot of the labor um, groups in St. Louis to fight the fact that they were taking $2 million directly away from the public school budget in St. Louis. Um, and it wasn't until we were approached by the Rockefeller Family Foundation that we thought that we could actually um, you know, get money for this to work from a climate perspective as well, um, and from the perspective of public health and climate change. Um, and so Take Back St. Louis really addressed that intersectionality. Um, it, it basically, what it was, was a, a citizen-led ballot, initi ballot initiative that we collected over 36,000 signatures for in the course of eight months to um, change the city charter to prohibit tax breaks from going to fossil fuel corporations and any other corporation that did a million dollars in business with them. So we weren't just hitting Peabody. We were hitting Bank of America. We were hitting um, the energy providers in St. Louis. Um, it was a very threatening ballot initiative to the powers that be. Um, and instead, that money was going to be reinvested into um, green job creation, into a local sustainable economy, and particularly address the fact, the issue that um, St. Louis has over 10,000 publicly owned, not even counting the privately owned, vacant lots within the city of St. Louis. Um, and that those lots were going to be opened up to the community for um, you know things like urban gardens and solar arrays and brownfield remediation, um, and so uh, as Jeff explained, the Take Back St. Louis initiative was basically attacked on all fronts um, by the corporate power. Um, one uh, sort of passing through the local courts, um, first a temporary injunction, and then um, having the uh, vote effectively blocked, and then two on the state level of being able to pass an amendment um, that would prohibit St. Louis. Um, from leading a ballot initiative that would limit coal tax breaks to coal corporations. Um, and it had a two-year limit on it. So it was very clearly in direct response to the work that we were doing. Um, personally, uh, taking a step back, um, my organizing has been very shaped by um, this sort of intersectional organizing and has led me into uh, what we call solidarity economy work. So. Um, my first kind of foray into community organizing was collecting signatures for the Take Back St. Louis campaign. Um, and through that, I sort of got in job, involved with some um, green job organizing um, through uh, the labor, sort of trying to organize green workers in the city. Um, and then eventually to basically say, how can we connect all of the existing new economy or alternative economy initiatives that already exist um, into a coalition that can lead campaigns for long-term political and economic power. And that's how Solidarity Economy St. Louis was born. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially what happened there is we, you know, gathered a very small group, maybe 30 or so people, who were already doing creative things like time banking, um, creative things like food cooperatives, uh, urban gardens, connecting them to each other to see what can we do together. Um, and from that group, we actually created a campaign to fight bench warrants in the city. Um, and just for a little bit of context, bench warrants uh, have been getting a lot of um, na national attention lately because of what's happening in Ferguson, but actually um, it's a very widespread problem in St. Louis. And what happens is uh, the cities that are very much strapped for cash 
will use traffic fines and court revenues to raise significant portions of their budget off of the lowest income people in their municipalities. And so um, you have municipalities that have that are making up to 40% of their budget from these traffic fines, millions and millions of dollars. Um, and for people who, who, who live this on a daily basis, um, what happens is, is you get a traffic fine, um, you either you know, come to court or if you, um, you come to court to either, if you can't pay the fine to justify why you can't pay it, and if you miss it for any reason, you have a warrant out for your arrest. So the result is you have people who have 20 to 30 warrants out at a time um, and who uh, in 20 to 30 different municipalities and have no possible option to pay these off. Um, people are being thrown in jail for these essentially modern day debtors prisons every day. Um, and so we, we basically said, how can we merge this new economy work with this issue of bench warrants in the city? Um, and we created a campaign to say, what if, what if time banking was a solution? What if people could use their time as money to um, you know, create a win-win situation where they're doing work in their community, they're building meaningful relationships, and rebuilding their neighborhoods um, while simultaneously paying the courts back? Um, and so we were leading that campaign before Ferguson. Um, and the, like I mentioned earlier, um, a huge tenet of more is this ability to work within movement moments and to be flexible. Um, and part of that is um, our work through Occupy. We were very involved in Occupy. Um, and right now is work in Ferguson. Every single staff person at Moore is working um, full time, 100% on organizing youth in Ferguson. And the way that relates to our bench warrants is that youth in Ferguson are very much connected to the issue of warrants, very much want to fight back on that issue. Um, but we're also, like I said, made a very intentional decision from the very beginning of um, creating the local coalition Hands Up United to lift up the Organization for Black Struggle, which um, for anybody who is familiar with the um, landscape of St. Louis, most of the leadership of these community organizations um, is you know, excludes people of color. And so our, our intention behind lifting up the Organization for Black Struggle as the leader of Ferguson was to fight back, fight that back a little bit and to push um, for, for them to gain resources in the movement. Um, the very last thing that I want to say very quickly is that uh, in terms of work that needs to be supported right now, um, we're trying to create a infrastructure in St. Louis that is um, not tied to organization, but tied solely to building the movement of for racial, just, racial justice and democracy. Um, and the, the way that that is going to be manifested is from October 10th through 13th, we're actually calling for a national mobilization in Ferguson um, for a march on the 11th, and then the 13th will be a distributed day of actions. So we're actually giving a list, people a list of corporate targets in St. Louis um, that can be hit. You know, we take 100 in people, yet 100 different actions happening at once in the city, um, you know, who knows what's happened. So um, for anybody who wants to talk to that more, I would, I would love to, to plug that a little bit. <laughs> um, so I think I'll close there because I'm over my time. <laughs> Well, thank you. This has been quite a landscape of, um, of issues and themes and opportunities that, that each of you have touched on. And it's really very exciting. There's a lot to explore. Um, and I wonder, and we're going to obviously have a, we have a good amount of time for conversation. Um, I just wanted to start by um, maybe inviting Heather to, to just um, Go a little bit deeper in this, the opportunities that you see, mm -hmm. particularly around kind of the kind of policy developments that you think can kind of make a difference and begin to break, break through some of the themes we're discussing. Sure. Um, I think that, um, well, first of all, I just want to say, I'm, I, and I said this to you when we talked on the phone in the pre in the pre organizing call, Julie. I think that the work that you're doing at more is just really transformational and phenomenal. So thank you for it. Um, I I think that when we think about solutions to this problem, it's important to define the problem correctly. And so um, if you define or define the problem according to your values, I'll put it that way. And so if you uh, if you define the problem as um, this is about continuing the march towards political equality and having higher expectations for 
the correlation between the size of your wallet and the size of your voice in a democracy, then it leads to certain solutions. And I think that right now, given the urgency of economic change, given the urgency of, um, of, 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 I think, distributed solutions to the climate crisis, we're going to have to get pretty bold about how we can reform our democracy to put more power in the hands of people who have um, very little money. Um, and fortunately, for, <laughs> for this moment, that's half of America. Right. Uh, the Federal Reserve um, did a survey of, of, of wealth recently that found that half of Americans could not pull together $400 to pay a bill without going into debt or selling something. So when we talk about less than 1% of Americans giving over $200 to a federal campaign, you know, it's really hard because particularly, you know, in this room and in the rooms of power in Washington, we are always talking about $5,000 checks, $10,000 checks, $50,000 checks, even $250 checks. It is outside of the participation, it, having that be the participation threshold for being able to have some influence over the people whose decisions shape your life is exclusive of most every American. So I think it's really important that we actually um, answer the, the call and demand from people for a fundamental shift about how uh, they see their government and their proximity to their government and their feeling of empowerment over their lives with um, matched public financing like we have here in New York City and if we are able to do what we need to do with the Constitution, because just for clarification, you can have public financing like we have here in New York City, right? A voluntary system of public financing where candidates opt in, right? Everyone's nodding, okay? You can have that under the current jurisprudence, at least today, right? Um, uh, because it is not restrictive of, um, of spending, except if you voluntary, uh, if, it's, if it's voluntary. And it doesn't address outside spending. If we were able to um, do what we need to do with uh, the constitutional amendment and or a rereading of the Constitution, which happens all the time and could happen very soon, um, we would be able to actually make that a system that was more than voluntary. We would be able to make a system where private donations are not part, private big donations are not part of the system. I think it's important to incentivize participation at the $5 level, which is at the level that most people can give comfortably. And I think it's important mostly because it means that candidates will actually have to knock on a door and ask someone for $5 and listen to what they have to say about the problems in their lives. And so I think that, and we've already seen that just in New York City, um, great research that the Brennan Center and the Campaign Legal Center did about how much more important neighborhoods like the Bronx and bed neighborhoods like bed and South Bronx uh, and Harlem are to candidates under public financing than they are to the candidates in Albany who just don't have to even go to the neighborhoods that they represent to raise money. So I think that it's very important that we solve for the lack of access to the political process by actually 99% of the country, um, but also really focus it on you know, the, the least well-paid half of the country. Um, and that's, that's all very possible. Yeah. Great. Jeff, do you want to add a comment to that? Um, yeah. Uh, my main comment is um, bravo here. <laughs> and I second that. Um, and, and Julia, thank you. It's, um, it is exciting. I think, um, you know, I think Heather's right that there's a lot we need to do very fast. Um, and um, in, in my view, the constitutional struggle helps drive things like public funding mm -hmm. because it causes a national conversation about political equality. And, and it, it not only causes it, um, it creates it. So when we do 600 city and town resolutions throughout New England, we have town meetings. Um, it's literally town meetings. The, the citizens of the town are in a room voting on the school budget and the 
you know, the snowplow budget, and we have a lot of that in New England, as you know, and things like things like that. And they debate Citizens United and political equality, and enact resolutions calling for the Twenty Eighth Amendment. Um, so when they do that, and they and they almost always overwhelmingly do it by seven to three margins, as Heather said, it's not. And this is true in the most conservative New Hampshire town. 47 towns in one week in New Hampshire did constitutional amendment resolutions um, in this manner. And it's, they're not even close. Americans get it. Um, and you know, sort of shame on us if we don't mm -hmm. <laughs> respond to their insistence that we actually are created equal. Um, we do, are entitled to participate all of us in self-government and the responsibilities of self-government. So when they when you do that, then things like oh, how do you empower five dollar donors actually not only make sense, but they they become imperative. Mm -hmm. um, when you do that, you then have you know disclosure, which seems like how in the name do we not only <laughs> have done nothing on disclosure, and we have more and more dark money, and as Allison said, a a dark money apocalypse, the hidden dollars coming in now. That's un intolerable if, if we actually believe that every citizen is, 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 has an equal right to participate in self-government. Um, so these things all go together. I don't think they're, they're exclusive. And actually in my book, I, I sort of have the three prongs of constitutional um, correction, I call it. It's not really change. With the change, as the book describes, has happened in the last in recent decades. So the correction is, is up to us. Uh, but then uh, the, the second uh, piece, and it's not in order of importance, is, is the public funding, the disclosure, things like the Anti-Corruption Act. There's a lot there. And then the third is a, a, a new way of thinking about corporations, things like benefit corporations and the new economy issues that many of you are so familiar with. That also becomes imperative when we're talking about, you know, democratizing our society. It means we democratize our workplace. It means why are we having socially responsible business as an option, an alternative? Like why do we, why do, we, why do our corporate laws say, you know, if you want to do it the normal way, you're extractive, destructive, irresponsible, and drive wealth from the many to the few. But oh, if you're really kind of green and wear bell bottoms, you can pick this option <laughs> of, a, of a benefit corporation. So I think all of these things begin to change. And, and I have found, um, and, and I think many of us have found, one way to drive these kind of reforms into serious conversation in every corner of America is to talk about the 28th Amendment and Citizens United and um, whether we are going to be the generation of Americans, the only one <laughs> that had a fundamental challenge right in front of us about whether we're created equal or not and decided, well, let's do disclose. <laughs> you know, it's, it's 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 really that that those are the kind of stakes I think, and 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 I, I think you know the work Heather's doing, the work Julie is doing, and the work we're trying to do, and the work many of you are trying to do, all of you, is really so interlocked and will accelerate fast if we, um, as Heather said, define the problem uh, for what it is. I think. Great, thank you. And I think defining that problem and not shying away from it is what's so fundamentally important and different about this work that all of you are doing. And um, Julia, I just wonder if you want to mention uh, the network that Moore is part of, the National Center for Popular Democracy, so, so that people know there's a, it's what you're doing in Missouri is so important, and, but it's also you, you're part of a network that is pursuing the same kind of goals and bold strategies nationally. Do you want to add anything about that? About national partnerships specifically? Your, or Center for Popular Democracy? Or? Yeah, so um, the Center for, Pop for Popular Democracy has been a really key um, partner for more, uh, not even just sort of in the connections they've laid out for us nationally, but on very concrete research policies. So um, just actually, it's being released, I think, very soon, maybe even today, um, they came. They they brought researchers to St. Louis to study the policies and and may, make recommendations. Like they made a 20-page report of recommendations for um, local government to create a sustainable and green economy in the city of St. Louis. And it included, um, you know, a variety of different things around housing, around vacant lots, um, and around issues of democracy in the city. And um, we're actually coming down to advocate to meet with the Board of Aldermen in our city to, to advocate for these changes. And um, 
now that the, now that report also includes or, or that visit is also including issues of police brutality um, and racist policing practices as well. So um, and I think also you know we're connected closely to the New Economy Coalition, um, and that was sort of our foray into a lot of these solidarity economy work. So there's a lot of different ways um, in sort of in w which we're part of a, a national conversation more broadly. Wonderful. So I, I invite people to dive in and, and challenge these folks, challenge their optimism with some certain <laughs> questions, <laughs> um, but I, I know because I know they'll have a good answer. And uh, yes, thank you. I don't know if Challenge, but I'm curious, um, especially for Julia, maybe just how you see corporations pushing back against your effort. Because it seems to me that 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 signals what's at stake and the tactics that they resort to to hold on to the status quo. Um, I, I mentioned this briefly um, earlier, and I think the Take Back St. Louis is a perfect illustration of what that looks like. Um, I think. Uh, you know, I want to really emphasize how specific <laughs> this state amendment was um, to respond to Take Back St. Louis. Essentially, it said, "No city in no city that is separated from its county in Missouri, which is only the city of St. Louis, can pass by ballot initiative a um, an amendment to their city charter to." Um, limit tax breaks to coal corporations, not even fossil fuel, but to coal corporations, which is only Peabody Energy, and it had a two-year limit. Um, I think that's a very specific way in which corporations are fighting back in St. Louis. Um, and as a student, um, back in, in uh, April, um, we actually um, led a 17-day occupation on our campus uh, to protest the connections between Peabody and um, Wash U and to generally start a conversation about corporate power in universities. And so I think another way in which corporations are very much fighting back is by having these very close connections to the most well-respected and elite institutions um, in the city. Just interrupt for just a second. Those who are answering questions, could they please take them like from me so that um, people who are out in the world uh, pick up your question? Those who are asking questions. Sorry, what did I say? Yeah, answer it. No, that's fine. So everyone who has a question, raise your hand, yeah. and a mic will visit you. May, may I just jump in on that that last question? Um, you know, I think for uh, and and maybe this is a temper to the optimism uh, because one of the big challenges now is uh, initially we were ignored. You know the old saying, and we're beyond the ignore stage, um, and we're beyond the ridicule stage, and we're into the fight stage. Um, and we saw that with the vote on the Senate floor, that was a wake-up call, I think, not only to the quote-unquote good guys, but to the bad guys as well, that this is for real and some strategies will be emerging on the other side. We did statewide ballot initiatives, and we, it's the larger, we, not just free speech for people, but, um, you know, the larger um, groups of uh, folks working on the constitutional amendment. We did statewide ballot initiatives in Montana in Colorado in 2012, presidential election year. Won both of them, 75-25. Um, and they were very explicit about political equality, about the role of corporations in society. It was not like a, you know, let's not have corruption or let's, let's have good government. It was very detailed specifics about what was wrong with Citizens United and why we needed an amendment to fix it. Should we have a 28th, should we, out west, they instruct their representatives, so they instructed their representatives to get the 28th Amendment out of Congress. Um, so, you know, Mitt Romney won Montana quite easily by 10 points, and then Montanans voted 75-25. Um, we could afford Montana in 2012 because there was no significant organized spending against us. I don't think we can count on that next time. Um, so, and the kind of arguments we hear uh, Senator Ted Cruz previewed on the Senate floor um, that we're after, we're going to lock up Saturday Night Live if they criticize um, politicians, um, sort of, it actually in some ways was comfortable, comforting because it, 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 was, um, it was almost overreach on the argument um, that made uh, Americans feel like, uh, uh, many Americans I think, that uh, that's ridiculous. Um, Senator Alan Simpson, retired 
Republican senator from Wyoming said about Ted Cruz's arguments that they were absolutely outrageous and quote unquote he should read the damn amendment because <laughs> it's actually you know it does restore the, the first amendment to, to what it has been for 200 years so um, I think we'll face a lot more uh, uh, money and we, therefore we need a lot more money on this side to get this done um, but I would finally say um, that corporations aren't people, but a lot of people work for corporations who actually agree with us. And many, many business leaders actually don't want to be in a pay-to-play economy or a pay-to-play society. And if you look at polls from of, of, of executives in even the biggest businesses, they tend to go our way as well. Um, but of course, there are corporate imperatives. And if you're working for a coal company, you can you need to and, and just one example, any example, where the, there's a corporate interest that is not the same as the human interest, and that's the problem. So we will face more money. It'll be not um, an intellectual debate about <laughs> on that side. You know, it'll be a lot of misleading sort of information to try to scare people that somehow we're, as they said during the Senate argument, repealing the First Amendment. So um, that's the kind of thing I think we'll see. Rachel, this is a good follow-up to what you were just talking. I'm sorry, if you could introduce yourselves again when reporting the same question. Rachel Bloom, Funders Committee for Civic Participation. So piggybacking off of what you said, in 2012 you could afford Montana, and you're not sure that you could moving forward. Um, what is, you know, I've worked on state ballot initiatives and state constitutional amendments. I've never worked on a on a federal constitutional amendment. So. Um, what is the cost? What are the projected costs? Where's the money going to come from? And what is the, what is the, is there a special, is it not C3 or C4, is it something else if it's a constitutional amendment? Um, because that is just so much money and, and where is it going to come from? Yeah. Um, glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's C3 activity, there's C4 activity, but I think the main strategy, and there's a roadmap coming together that Sarah's working hard on and others, um, but I think the way I think of it, and I'm on the funding side, the funder side as well, um, the way I think of it is the most effective things we can do with our money is fund the catalyst, catalytical kind of work here, because what constitutional amendment campaigns are about is massive cultural, political, social, change so there is no there is not going to be you know one sort of monolithic group that gets this done instead I think what we do is look for effective tools that give people what they want to do which is say we want to overturn Citizens United we want our voice back um, and so that's what the resolutions are about so we've cre we've created a lot of tools that people are actually using these resolutions sometimes happen because an organizer makes them happen they sometimes happen and I describe people in my book doing this they download a draft resolution off a website, they take it to their meeting, and they, they're kind of nervous because they've never done this before. <laughs> you know, the last amendment was in 19, uh, well, 92, but that one doesn't really, that had been first proposed in 1787. But <laughs> it took a while to ratify. <laughs> but uh, 1971, to lower the age, the voting age. Um, so, but the ERA, I think a lot of people had experience with that, and I, I often look at that, the Equal Rights Amendment, as a model for why we shouldn't worry about, oh, you know, this is going to cost too much and we might not win. I think the ERA actually changed the world by fighting for it. And you can see this, how this sort of insistent demand for justice actually drives a lot of social change even before the amendments ratified. So you're right, it's just way too big to think about how much will this all cost, but there's a lot of really effective strategies with real budget numbers that are very affordable that give citizens tools to take this into their community anywhere, um, and it won't it won't be all you know big TV ballot initiative advertising kind of budgets. Um, just to add in there that I think one template we could look at in terms of infrastructure capacity and cost would be the marriage equality movement, which also succeeded in fundamentally shifting a dominant jurisprudence or is succeeding. And so if you you know if you look at that not as a perfect fit, but as an example of the kind of organizing that's both political education, cultural change, and 
you know, state by state organizing, I think that's perhaps the closest model that we have to Great. what it would take. Great. Great analogy. Thank you. Um, Jay? Oh, sorry, you're fast. You're fastest. Okay. Jay Beckner, Gilmore Foundation. Picking up on the good corporate, uh, sort of bad corporate players that you were talking about, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the recent, uh, I guess, million signatures to uh, try to get the SEC to enforce disclosure for corporate piece of good news, but how that would play into your, your larger efforts of transparency. Yes, absolutely. So, um, uh, you know, as Jeff said, the idea that um, the idea that it's okay to um, spend a lot of money because you know people can make their own decisions about um, about where it came from requires that there actually be disclosure, um, and we our disclosure is, is riddled with massive massive loopholes right now. Most importantly, um, for this issue of the SEC. Uh, there is a, a belief that I think is a very, very good analysis that shareholders should actually know how their uh, corp the corporations that the, they own are participating in politics, and that's actually not currently um, a requirement. And so there has been, you know, as with everything in this issue, I mean, I say so often that you know, if if progressives had these good, uh, you know, poll numbers on all the things that we work on, we would, you know, be able to fold up shop or something. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, anything that we do around Citizens United just creates this, you know, this wildfire. And so, including a petition to the Securities and Exchange Commission for rulemaking, you know, I mean, um, and I think they've, they had a million signatures, and I think they had a million more in this room, in this, in this go around this year. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, part of the uh, corporate governance regime. And what's been exciting about that is that a lot of the stakeholders uh, in the coalition, which is um, coordinated by public campaign, um, have been, you know, institutional investors and pension funds, and you know, really kind of a, a really kind of diverse, um, including uh, corporate and, and shareholder activist groups, about the need for. Um, uh, shareholder disclosure, um, which can then, you know, which then is just one step, right? Then you have the campaigns around it, then you have, you know, you organize shareholders to be active, right? It's not, again, disclosure is never anything but the first step. Great. That's an, and that's a very important point. Thank you. Okay. I'm Ben Shute, currently with the Grassstein Fund. Um, I'd like to hear a little more about the corporate law reform piece of work. Uh, as I recall, the other night on uh, PBS, uh, I heard Teddy Roosevelt uh, saying that corporations are creatures of the state. Uh, it seems to me it's gotten to be the other way around. Oh. Bring back Teddy. <laughs> Bring back Teddy. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Sean. Take, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So we, we do have a corporate law reform program at, at um, Free Speech for People, working with scholars and judges and others to um, uh, act on the fundamental truth that corporations actually they don't exist in nature they only exist if we the people decide to enact a law that allows people to use a corporate entity and and you know as you say Ben it was a bargain it's a state created entity with and the bargain is you know you get advantages like limited liability and perpetual life for the enterprise but in the old days, you had obligations and a public interest in the corporate conduct. And we've lost that second part. And it's now all advantage and, and, and not much accountability. So um, if we remember that we actually you know, elect the people who write those laws, uh, there, there is no you know, inherent right to use a corporate entity. There's no inherent right to have limited liability. All those things are up for political small p debate. And so we're taking that debate in a number of different directions. When Massey Energy um, killed 29 coal miners in the Upper Big Branch mine explosion after 65,000 violations of the Mine Safety Act and an independent report of the governor, a governor appointed independent commission concluded that they, those men died because of political influence that the state and the federal regulators no longer, as you say, it's almost a sovereign entity, the Massey Coal Corporation. They had no um, protection from the law anymore, the mine workers. Um, and uh, they also, by the way, had 13,000 violations of Clean Water Act uh, for dumping the 
tailings of the of the mountain that used to be mountains which were, they used for coal extraction into the streams. We brought um, a a a um, an action in, with the Delaware Attorney General. Every state in the country has a charter revocation um, law that says if you violate the privilege of incorporation, the Attorney General is supposed to bring an action to consider essentially like a receivership and a revocation of the right to incorporate. Um, people I insisted on this when, because of the traditional concern about the power of corporate privileges, um, and you know, we thought 65,000 strikes and you're out. Uh, but but if we're still waiting for the Delaware Attorney General to act on that. Um, but we also have a number of um, uh, B corporations are actually a very interesting model, benefit corporations, which are now in 27 states. But we're looking at sort of approaches to Citizens United with corporate law and, and working on a draft model um, state incorporation law, which would essentially enable states to say, um, if you want to incorporate or do business in this state, you don't use the corporate entity. It's for economic purposes, not political purposes. So don't, you, you're not, you don't have to do it. You don't have to incorporate. But if you do, you can't be doing political spending, do economic spending. Um, and that would no doubt be challenged under the sort of prevailing ideology of Citizens United, but it would be a healthy challenge. Um, and we think we create a very real tension between the traditional legal truth that corporate, the states actually are empowered to enact laws like that. And um, so there's a lot of other ideas which you can have time to, but thank you for raising that great point. Great. And just to follow up, you're having, uh, you mentioned you're having a conference, oh, yes. co-convening a conference at Harvard. Do you want to say the dates? And when yes. Because it's about this topic, I believe. Yeah, so um, Professor John Coates is on our legal advisory committee. He's a uh, professor of corporate law at Harvard and Harvard Law School and John, uh, Professor Coates and Free Speech for People are convening and advancing the jurisprudence of democracy and particularly focused on corporations um, and the Constitution. It's November 7th in Cambridge. Um, it's actually um, uh, by invitation because <laughs> the, uh, so Sarah's pointing, to talk, to, talk to Sarah if you're interested. Uh, well, there's actually, it's, we, we are welcoming a healthy debate and not asking everybody to agree. And so we have a number of scholars from around the country who are coming in to debate and talk openly uh, in a way that isn't, uh, is, is, is somewhat academic, but very important. And then there'll be a public portion where Senator John Tester from Montana, who introduced a constitutional amendment that's sort of parallel to the Democracy for All amendment and would overturn the part about corporations being people under Citizens United, he'll be giving a keynote. So uh, there'll be a lot of interesting both conversation, legal scholarship to come out of that. There will be a report and a journal of, of, of the legal scholarship that comes out of that. Um, and I think it will continue to advance uh, a lot of different ideas, not just constitutional, but about corporate law as well. And it's so important that you are having this kind of continuing a robust debate because this is a topic of which there are many different opinions, you know, different legal opinions, different popular opinions, and it's in order to pass the ultimate test, I think they all need to be explored and played out and tested in various courts. So we have another question I want to um, touch, and, sorry. Okay, <laughs> no, please, Julia, add a comment, please, and then we'll go to you. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on the question of, of and, and what Jeff was talking about with um, sort of corporate responsibility to the community. And um, I think on in St. Louis, um, the most common argument you hear is, well, these corporations are providing jobs for the people. Um, and we were actually able to obtain the report for 2013 of the number of jobs that Peabody provided, and it was a blank sheet of paper. Um, so I think, you know, um, and that coupled with the fact that a lot of these tax incentives are given in the form of tax increment financing or TIF dollars, um, and that the board that is making decisions on these TIF dollars in St. Louis has um, never a single time denied a TIF to any corporation um, and to any you know development project. And so um, about a year ago, we fought a $7 million TIF to Laclede, which was a gas, um, sort of the gas utility company in St. Louis. And they were receiving a $7 million TIF to essentially move three blocks. 
Um, they weren't doing anything different. They were just moving out of their current headquarters into a different headquarters that was slightly more downtown. Um, and so we fought very hard against that TIF, and actually um, it really catalyzed a change in public opinion about what these TIFs are for, um, and that people realize, wait, you know, there's there's no reason why this this money needs to be given um, to this body, and it's in no way benefiting anyone. Um, and and to the issue of green jobs, looking at the landscape of green jobs in the city, you know, um, if you look sort of nationally, the uh, Green jobs are, are the only like sector that have really you know improved in the in recent years, and um, the issue in St. Louis is that there is a lot of training given for these jobs, and a lot of people are very well qualified to um, have these jobs, but those jobs don't exist. Um, and so I think that's another issue too is looking at like how do you um, that's why Take Back St. Louis was so beautiful is because it was taking the money um, that people really didn't even have a say on um, and putting it into um, a system that was kind of proven to work. Thank you. Very, very timely illustration of the points. So Laura Wolf, Robert Sterling Clark, I wondered if you could speak to how you see linking this work or the extent to which, and obviously everybody can only, you know, not, can't work on everything, but I think it would be a shame if it were not clearly linked to the whole issue of voter registration because it's easy to send a message here which I know is not what you want to send which is that money is ultimate power and in fact it is a lot of power and it's been used that way but we do still have a one person one vote system and we have abysmal voter registration and abysmal voter participation and so this seems to me to be a naturally allied issue that you, yes, you want people to be able to spend five dollars, and they can. I think it's misleading actually to say that we're saying people can't spend. We are saying that some people can spend a lot more, but we're not saying people can't spend. But even if they can't spend, they can vote and they can get their friends and their relatives. And so, and yes, there's all kinds of restrictions on voting that we have to keep fighting, mm -hmm. but I, I guess I was surprised to hear this issue talked about as the ultimate trump card. It doesn't change the need for litigation that corporations are not people and all the issues related to that that aren't about enfranchisement. But I think that since a lot of your movement is about the political power of spending, to link it to the political power of voting mm -hmm. might be a good marriage. That's yes, wonderful. I, I couldn't and, agree more. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think that's great. And thank you. And, and the Funders Committee for Civic Participation thanks you. And we'll be sending your check later um, for that fantastic question. Heather, um, I, I would love for you to answer this. And obviously, this is an arena. And not obviously, but it is an arena that, that Demos does incredibly important work. In particular, I wonder if you could talk about your work on um, NVRA enforcement. Sure, no problem. Yes, no problem. So uh, thank you for that question. Um, it, so the other part of our work, really the only other, I mentioned it a little bit, but so we have four big areas of our work around upward mobility, new economy, um, the freedom to vote, which is what we call it, and money and politics. And they are linked. Um, the essential, so two things. One, I think it is really important, not only when we talk about this, for us to still make it um, particularly to the public, still um, you know, motivate people to vote, right? Because all of these changes that we're talking about, the amendment, public financing, all of that, require um, you know, legislators to be accountable um, to, to voters uh, for their desires to see those reforms. Um, you know, we really look at the voting, uh, the voting turnout issue as a structural one around um, needless red tape around the voter registration process. One in four Americans is not registered to vote. That's 51, I'm sorry, one in four eligible citizens is not registered to vote. That's 51 million eligible citizens are not registered. Um, Right, right. I actually like have those numbers from something I was talking about earlier today. So 39% of unmarried women are unregistered. 51% of 18 to 29 year olds, 48% uh, of Latinos, and 37% of African Americans are not registered to vote. 
There you go. Um, so there are a lot of reforms that can, A, eliminate the need for, I mean, the you know, since we're talking big transformational stuff, you know, eliminate the need for voter registration altogether. North Dakota does not have voter registration. Right? Voter registration is in itself a, um, a voter suppressive tactic. Um, same day registration is sort of the nearest best thing we can do and it usually boosts turn up by about 10 percentage points and we've been, um, you know, fighting on that issue in, um, we've got over a dozen states since we started working on it, um, or seven new states since we started working on that issue. And um, and it's really important. It's sort of easy to pass. I mean, it's easy to fight on because you can, you know, and one of the things that we do is we bring election officials from states with same-day registration to the state where there's a legislative campaign, you know, and they sort of say, it's actually great. It makes it a lot easier. If someone shows up and they, you know, have moved or something, they can still vote and it's not a provisional ballot and it's, it's, um, it actually makes uh, the whole system a lot um, easier as well as um, being uh, a boost to turnout. Um, I think it's really important though that we recognize that we can have the expectation of 100% voter registration, voter freedom, uh, voter turnout, voter participation. Um, one of the reasons why elected officials are unresponsive to the working and middle class if their policy preferences depart from that of the donor class is because the voter registration and turnout rates are lower among working and middle class people. However, it is also true that the, um, you know, the middle class votes in, you know, the, the gulf in terms of turnout between the middle income quintiles and the top income quinti the top quintiles is not that big. And there's still that massive deferential and responsiveness because of the money. So we really see it as two sides of the same coin. Can I, Allison, just um, quickly, yeah. very Sorry. quickly just disavow or uh, um, correct any misimpression that that is not a huge issue for us. and and, and I'll just quickly correct it by saying, by pointing to our co-founder John Boniface there, who, uh, who we were a, when we started Free Speech for People, we were a project of Voter Action, which was John's group. He founded National Voting Rights Institute, and if I can really brag, he won a MacArthur Genius Grant for his work on voting rights. So it's a hundred percent agreement with what your point is, um, and I just uh, don't want to leave any misimpression about what we're doing. I agree exactly with Heather as well on these the way these work together and any fix has to get voters to vote. Sorry, Allison, you asked me to, to quickly to just talk about the NVRA. The National Voter Registration Act, John, I reminded, 20-year-old bipartisan, 21-year-old bipartisan bill, which every day is asking, is requiring states to register, offer people the opportunity to register to vote when they interact with the public agency. The Department of Justice should be enforcing it because it's a federal law in the books. Instead, we enforce it and 17 states we've been running around suing people. And the result has been two and a half million new low-income voter registration applications. The next frontier of that work is the Affordable Care Act, which is a public benefit. And so states and the federal exchanges should be offering really rig rigorous and robust voter registration opportunities. And we are doing that advocacy now as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add on to what, this is John Bond, I wanted to add on to what Heather has said. I, I fully agree and I do think that, you know, these are two sides of the coin. Dr. Gwen Patton, a longtime civil rights activist and leader from Montgomery, Alabama, spoke at a Waveland, Mississippi conference in 1990 in which activists from the environmental movement, peace movement, civil rights movement had gathered together to talk about how is campaign finance a voting rights issue of our time. And she said at that conference that getting private money out of politics is a voting rights issue of our time and that we don't have the right to vote if we don't have candidates to vote for. So the other side of the coin of what Heather has talked about is in addition to the fact that we need to get people registered, we need to get rid of these barriers including voter registration to the vote itself, people need to have candidates to vote for. And we don't have candidates to vote for when we have this exclusionary process that blocks out any meaningful participation by candidates who don't have access to wealth. So the vast majority of races at the federal level and state and local level even are not really challenged. There's not really any competition. So, you know, I went to vote the other day in the primary in Massachusetts. There were plenty of races where there was no candidate going up against the incumbent who was in office. So I think that we have to recognize that we do want to get people to vote, but we got, we got to get them to vote for a reason. There's got to be some competition. There's got to be some debate 
in the process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony from the Young Foundation in London. So, um, thank you first of all for this. Feels like I'm living my dream of being in an episode of The West Wing. So, <laughs> um, it's fascinating insight for us. But I wanted, um, if I may, to give you a bit of reflection. I guess from we're a global organisation, but there are, you know, in about two hours' time across the Atlantic, 97% of the Scottish public will have mm -hmm. voted mm -hmm. on uh, on a referendum, which looks like it's going for. Uh, independence as we speak. So um, now I, f I can't remember the last time more than 30% of the population of the United Kingdom voted an election, certainly mm -hmm. not in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's something there to reflect on in an election that is fundamentally being fought on uh, a manifesto of inequality, where the democratic power is held in the, the UK, fundamentally that uh, a country based to the left of politics and very social manifestos and values feels very switched off from uh, the power of FTSE 100 companies uh, in and around Westminster and the, the centre of power. I'll leave you to dwell on that and watch CNN as the results mm -hmm. come in a, a few hours' time. Um, but I also wanted to give you a bit of context, I guess, uh, as to why um, where Young Foundation sits in this and possibly talk to some of the solutions that we're looking at globally on um, how we use this movement for uh, world to come and, and tackle some of these issues. So um, the quick story from Young Foundation is that uh, we exist uh, to maintain and build on the legacy of Lord Michael Young, who uh, 65 years ago, one of the, the architects of the welfare state in the United Kingdom, one of the architects of the NHS system in the United Kingdom. Um, our work is focused very much on if you can't tackle the inequality by getting politicians, elites, corporates and whoever else uh, to respect the will and movement of people, then sod them, let's create a new institution, which has in our lifetime led to Open University, a world leader in, uh, in uh, equal education and accessible education uh, with 300,000 students globally at any one time. Uh, which the Consumer Association, a powerful uh, association of two and a half million members, talking to each other at any one time around the globe as to what products they like and which companies they, they definitely don't want to engage with. And more and more institutions like that. And there appears to be, uh, I guess, another angle. Uh, you know, we, you, you have the particular issue of constitutions and whatever else in the US to, to get around. And, and legal issues that we don't quite have to face in in the UK. And I guess one of the movements that's happening in Europe is less about talking about B Corps and having to look at governance models of corporations and actually refocusing on what matters to us as an economy. How do we get back to the point of saying that uh, the social part of the economy is the most important aspect of economy? Um, <laughs> and I guess the, the challenge here for us is that um, if we leave the movement of going back to a social economy, particularly in the UK, we still have a very elite system no matter what side of the politics you look at. Um, our entire front bench of cabinet members in government come from two universities, uh, from very wealthy families, no matter which part of the, the country they're supposed to represent. But we're channeling an idea um, that, that stops trying to create new governance models. So we've looked closely at uh, B Corp models, we have a huge growth of social enterprise models in the UK and across Europe, mm -hmm. but they don't challenge the dominance mm -hmm. of large corporations. And so one of the things and one of the reasons I'm here in the, the US this week is to talk to some of the largest corporations about actually um, how do we start to get you to be more open? How do we get corporations to be honest about uh, you know, the gender equality gaps they're creating? Do they pay a living wage? how many corporations are they advising on how not to pay tax in the mm -hmm. country they're registered in, those sorts of issues. Because fundamentally, and you only have to look back at the last uh, five years of recession in the UK to see what really matters to the population of the UK. So Starbucks not uh, paying any tax mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom, um, despite having made hundreds of millions out of that population. They all of a sudden are now paying tax in the United Kingdom because nearly 5 million people on one day did not go to their stores. Mm -hmm. It's that sort of movement that isn't really being challenged. And I think this comes back to the topic of movement building, the, you know, the, the, the uncut movements, those mm -hmm. sorts of things that I think need to be a stronger and equal partner in that picture of 
litigation, voter registration, uh, and, and more widely. But, uh, but I guess globally reflecting on some of those movements and showing Americans, you know, if you want to challenge your corporation, stop shopping there. Mm-hmm. If you're fed up of the way Walmart doesn't pay a certain level of wage, stop shopping there. There are deeper, I appreciate deeper issues there to enable that. But I think that's the sort of thing we can get behind. Wonderful. I'm going to ask Julia to speak to this. Um, this is a very short comment, but I also want to be explicit. I've been in a lot of circles where we're talking about the new economy, social economy, solidarity economy, and very um, infrequently is the word capitalism said. So I think that, um, I want to be very explicit in that, you know, I think that part of the conversation is not just corporate power, it's corporate capitalism and it's anti-capitalism. Um, and that's the perspective that we come from. And I, kn- I know that a lot of groups don't come from that perspective, but I also think that um, moving that narrative forward is actually extremely powerful on a global level. Thank you. Yes. Here comes the microphone. Daniel Friedman, Cloud Mountain Foundation. Um, your uh, wonderful uh, soliloquy um, brought to mind uh, the fact that uh, Europeans, uh, by and large, have a tradition of engagement and tradition of voting that seems to have disappeared in the United States. And uh, I can speculate that one of the reasons behind that is the fact that you actually still have uh, a a vibrant and vital uh, public uh, information system through the BBC, um, through uh, your public news and information sources. And I wondered whether uh, any of the panelists would care to discuss the issues of circumventing uh, a uh, news uh, system, a media dispersal system in this country that is uh, corporate controlled and uh, with interlocking directorships uh, in uh, many of the corporations uh, that are the most egregious uh, ones in this country uh, and uh, seemingly have um, with or without uh, collusion uh, an equal ability to disseminate uh, the least informative, uh, the least meaningful uh, kinds of information that uh, Americans uh, seem are told gobble up uh, uh, and and seem to want, but in fact, uh, there's they don't have an alternative. Um, where do you suggest we go and how to circumvent that? Do you want to go? Sure. Um, you look like you're ready. So. Uh, well, so um, I think that the need for um, democratizing media and corporate media reform is very urgent and is actually a part of this whole ecosystem. Um, And there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done in this moment around net neutrality and there's a lot to be done really in the same transformational space of what we're talking about. Like how do we really um, envision an entirely, a much more democratic um, form of of media production and ownership. Um, we've gotten so far away from the kind of media ownership rules that we had even just a generation ago around diversity um, that we really are going to have to really rethink. And for the mobile technology age and beyond, um, what it is. And I I do think that. Um, um, why am I blanking on the name of the organization. Thank you, Free Press. I'm sitting here next to Free Speech for People. I was like, Free <laughs> free Press for People, Free, yes. Um, that um, Free Press is doing good work on this, um, but I also think there, there, there needs to be more in the ecosystem to be looking at that sort of really transformational um, vision of what it would look like. The same, you know, sort of small donor distributed uh, energy generation. What does that model look like in terms of media production? Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Um, do you want to add to that, Jeff? And then just I a really, well. just mm-hmm. a really quick comment. Um, yeah, I was interested that Heather finished on energy um, because I do think if the media concentration is another manifestation. You can look at almost every industry: food, um, energy, media, and you see the same concentration because we've seen the complete um, sort of disassembly not only of campaign finance laws but antitrust laws. 
the FCC. So, you know, Bob Monks, another one of our legal advisory committee members, many of you may know, has a book, Corporate Capture, Citizens Disunited, about corporate capture. And I think, again, if we can um, free press and all the, the, the net neutrality work is super important, but I think if we do the kind of work we're all talking about um, and, and the sort of justice and political equality work, we'll actually see a, a kind of new era of reform um, as we have in other periods where because the public voice actually gets some balance and we'll see balance with antitrust laws, FCC laws, um, we won't accept the kind of concentrations that we now see not only in media but in almost every industry. Julie, would you like to add? Yeah, this is a really um, sort of small silver lining to that too and, and it's very uh, relevant to what's happening in Ferguson right now. Um, going back to what Heather said briefly about um, understanding the sort of technological age we're in, um, I would also say that um, the, the way that media is distributed is changing very rapidly and particularly with um, my generation and the younger generation. Um, and if you look at what's happening in Ferguson right now, the people who are leading that movement and the way that news is distributed is through these social media networks and by um, a very um, newly politicized and radicalized um, black youth leadership. And so I think that that's really important to note um, However, obviously, there's a lot of major imperfections with how media is um, portraying that situation as well. So, so one of the fundamentally important things about this um, issue is, and, and it was mentioned briefly, but the net neutrality fight that's going on right now is critically important to the protection of the development of the new kinds of information dissemination that Julie is talking about. Um, you know, without Net neutrality, we face a prospect of a fast lane and a slow lane. It increases the corporate concentration and control of content on the internet. There are a lot of very good resources, such as Free Press, on this topic. I'm happy to talk about it more later. We work with a, uh, something called the Media Democracy Fund, which, um, which is a wonderful resource. And it's a campaign that is very timely this year and which there is great need for that. Um, it's also a silver lining issue where there are models of new economy, uh, municipal ownership of broadband, uh, development. It's, it's an area of tremendous innovation and new kinds of kind of ownership models and opportunity as well. So happy to talk more about that later. We are getting close to time. I know you had your hand up, but we have a new speaker. So unless this is exactly to this point. started uh, in the UK where we have 80% of our media is owned by five people, five mm -hmm. families, Rupert Murdoch being probably the largest one and a problem for you as much as us. Uh, but one way of changing it, which comes back to your movement uh, building point, um, a campaign has been launched called Let's Own the News. Mm -hmm. So the population of the UK can now raise 100 million pounds themselves to buy the two largest newspapers, which will fundamentally shift from 80% hmm. to reducing that down to 42% ownership of those families of those newspapers. So, and which needs no government legislation, is putting the power back into individuals, it takes no more than five pound per person in the UK to do a movement of that scale. So there are, there are ways and means of, of tackling that. How fantastic in contrast that to Jeff Bezos buying mm -hmm. the Washington Post. Okay, we're down. Oh, okay, uh, and then next to you. I'm, no, Ellen I'm from, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. He's had his hand up for a while. I'm Ellen from Angelina. Um, it's a very interesting and challenging thing, this constitutional amendment and rebalancing corporate power. And the question is, how are people going to get recruited? People, not us, but average people, the people who are disenfranchised and who are going to corporate events and eating corporate food and experiencing life is defined by the corporate offerings in a way. We're, we were pretty far down that path. And um, where I see holes in, hopeful holes in this scenario is in net neutrality, the locavore food thing, sort of take back our food thing. And something else that was just mentioned here, Kickstarter. What an unbelievable thing. I mean, a lot of the innovations happening, a lot of the reclaiming of participatory something, maybe not democracy, seems to be happening in uh, coming out of the tech 
opportunities that the technolo new technology has afforded us. So it's, I don't, uh, that's all I want to say. I know that uh, looking at this from the perspective of the ERA and uh, it will take years and years. This is an abstract fight. I mean, it's a very complicated intellectual argument that you guys are making and to sell the average person on this to make the misery of their immediate life connected to a constitutional amendment because of corporate power and politics, there has to be some path from A to B. And I don't know what it is, and maybe it hasn't identified, it's not, maybe it hasn't, it's not available yet, but it seems to me there are breaks in the culture that are being introduced in these interesting ways. So that's my thought. Thank you. That's a great comment. Um, Jeff, do you want to just briefly add the yes, everyday people resist. connection? I know. I know you must. And I then must. you'll take um, your comment. And I respect, you're, you're quite right about, the, I think, the hopeful springs we're seeing in all sorts of areas, including the local food, which I think are expressions of the same sense of um, wanting both authenticity and, um, you know, their, their lives again. Yeah. And, 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 but I have to just tell you, you know, what, I think people actually do get it. It's not actually as difficult as we thought to make. In some ways, it's constitutional law that's tricky, but in other ways, you know, overturning Citizens United, should money be unlimited, should corporations have rights to veto our laws? It's people are there already. I was, and I'll just say one co quick illustration. I was on a radio show in Arizona recently, an extremely right-wing radio show. The first hour was about um, libertarian, you know, republic. And then they went the next hour by the same host is America Armed and Free, which is all guns all the time. Um, and we had such a good conversation, and the calls were coming in that he, we rolled right into America Armed and Free. <laughs> and, and, and we did not talk about guns. And one guy called up, and he said to me, uh, Mr. Clements, that was like the last nice word he said, but it wasn't like he was disagreeing with me. He thought I was too soft on corporations. He, he said, he said, and this is a direct quote, he said, um, actually about the amendment and things, you know, if you think that our government isn't already a completely corporate fascist state, you ought to take your head out of the New York Times. <laughs> so I think, I think many, many people are already there and they're looking for ways to kind of live out of that, you know, to get out of that. And sometimes it's local food. Some, but if we give them an amendment, a chance to vote on the amendment, I don't think they need a lot of nuanced argument about it. No, 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 no. This is all, this is all Arizona. Arizona, love it. All right, we have a question or comment. From this has been such a great, wide-ranging conversation. <laughs> I feel like I've learned so much from the questions and everyone around the table. But I, I, the three of you have a proven track record of generating success by, by taking incremental steps toward long-term goals. So I have a question for you, which is coming up the end of this year and next year, what are you working on and what needs to be funded in the short <laughs> term to keep your work moving forward? Okay, and before you answer that question, you had a quick yes. comment. Uh, first of all, I have so much to say on the subject because I've been. I'm, okay, can, oh, yes. sorry. Can okay. you introduce yourself and just make it very brief? Yes. Work, um, Angelique Arutuno, I'm with AWED, and I'm happy to talk to many of you about this um, because we've been researching private sector involvement in funding women and girls because we had the new flavor of the last five years. Um, and we have actually learned a lot of uh, ways of engaging with it, and it was very interesting to hear hear anything from citizenship to consumer rights and how those two relate and working on the inside and outside of the corporations. And thank you for bringing up the big elephant in the room, capitalism, uh, which is very hard to engage with the corporations to dismantle the system that feeds them um, and that they are part of. And the question also for me is always when I'm talking to foundations, foundations are also products of that system. Mm -hmm. And I often see uh, a reluctance by foundations to be very political and very uh, problematically engaging on this, uh, with exceptions like what the Wallace Fund is doing with the Divest Invest, with what Oak Foundation right now is doing, actually sitting down with the corporate sector and talking about how they're investing in women and girls and talking about the language. What would you want to see the foundations, especially in this country, 
that are often apolitical mm -hmm. to engage in because that would mean that their stream of funding will also have to change. Excellent pair of questions. So we're going to wrap this up with the very short, sharp, and shiny wish list from <laughs> our from our panelists. Um, and uh, let's just do it super quick. We can't say everything we'd like to see or have happen, but um, but if you could each give us an example of kind of the innovation and important important elements that you would like to point to in your own organization or elsewhere, and um, and then we will we'll call this to a close. Great, um, thank you, Julian. Uh, I want to speak to sort of your question earlier, Rachel, which was, you know, how do we how do we raise the resources to get these massive changes done? And I think the response to that um, really illustrates this point well: is that we don't have, we we can never have the organized money that exists right now um, in in corporate capitalism, but we can't have the organized people. And so I think to the to the question of how do you um, what needs to be funded, sort of very concretely, what needs to be funded is things that get people on the ground, knocking on doors, organizing, you know, really having intentional conversations with people and giving um, and empowering them to create those solutions. You know, so I think um, that can be applied in a lot of different ways. Um, in, in the way that it's being applied in Ferguson right now, like I said, this mobilization, um, you know, we're hiring canvassers to go out and to organize people to turn out for this mobilization. It's a very concrete thing, but it's getting people on the ground. It's getting them talking to extended networks, and it's organizing people. Um, and it, to me, it really is that. All right, organizing. Thank you. Organizing in Ferguson, organizing in Missouri, and organizing around the world. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? So we have three um, sort of key things in the next uh, 12 months. and, and the legal advocacy program is critical, uh, not, and not just in the law school conferences. We did an analysis. The reason this exists, nobody was showing up. Um, I, don't, I shouldn't say nobody. In this litigation that goes on, it was very siloed, issue-specific mm -hmm. litigation. Nobody was there to make the bigger sort of justice argument um, about how we're interpreting the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, I'm generalizing, but in mm -hmm. a lot of these cases, we need, we need uh, you know, to use that awful metaphor, boots on the ground. You know, we need lawyers there doing briefs, raising these arguments. Then we need the tools uh, that en en empower the people in those communities to take it out of the courtroom. Um, and this is what worked in Montana. We took a case to the Supreme Court challenging Citizens United. That's the reason 75% of Montanans came out to vote for a constitutional amendment. The two go together. So we have detailed uh, budgets and programs. We can talk to Sarah about or others about <laughs> Um, exactly where it goes, but much better to tools for citizens to empower themselves, um, much better ways to link the litigation out, to get it out of the courtroom mm -hmm. so that the social um, movement is joined with the legal fight. Um, and then uh, and then number three, the constitutional amendment work. Um, there's a lot of C3 work that needs to be done um, that isn't just valid initiatives, but especially after the Senate vote, that was a great historic milestone. But the downside is we now have to hold this cross-partisan coalition, uh, or not coalition, but just this larger American movement, and not let it, not let them do what they did with climate change to make it a 50-50 confusing issue. Um, but really hold the you know wide American consensus about this, even in light of the Washington sort of polemics. Thank you. Thank you. And that'll get even sharper on climate change after this weekend. Um, yes, <laughs> we're done with that. Heather. OK. Um, uh, two things in terms of Demos's work. Thank you, Ben, former board member, for the question. <laughs> former board member of free <laughs> speech with people, current, right? <laughs> current board member. <laughs> I like it. Um, um, so one is. Um, the, the report that um, was on the table that's on our website um, called Stacked Deck, which it really talks about how the dominance of politics by the affluent and business are undermining mobility, economic mobility in America, is we're doing a, a follow-up to the report and an entire sort of organizing effort um, to ensure that all of the different groups and communities and people, even that we as an organization speak to, right? So we straddle the economic justice, the voting rights, the civil rights, um, young people organizing around student debt, the new economy world, right? They're all um, 
people that we have connections with, and we think that the leadership of the money and politics field needs to change and expand to include them, right? To include um, the people whose issues are, are deeply implicated by our current system. And so we want to put ourselves as an organization in service of that effort for the next couple of years. Um, so that is something that we are raising money to be able to do and to be able to re-grant and do all of that work. Um, with a particular focus on, on, on communities of color and racial justice organizing groups. Um, and then in terms of um, the uh, what foundations can do and should do, I, th I loved that question. Um, related, um, foundations that are funding on you know, the environment, on childcare, on poverty, on women's issues, should be tithing to these democracy issues, right? I mean, all of these issues, the goals that they have, the asset building goals, wiped out in one crash because of the power of Wall Street and Washington, right? So it's very, very important that we really think of the field of money and politics as the field of policy change, period. And that's work that foundations can do. Fantastic and tithing. Let's go for it. Um, I would like to thank everyone for coming to this. I'd like to thank our panelists very much. I'd like to invite everyone to stay for the kind invitation to Wine and Cheese book signing. And um, you'll get to take home your own copy of Corporations Are Not People. Um, and, but I really, once again, I, and I'd like to thank Philanthropy New York for hosting this event and for our kind um, organizers of this program. This series is, is really an interesting uh, and challenging and provocative set of topics. And, we need to have these kinds of conversations more often in philanthropy. So thank you so much for bringing us together. And thank you again, you three. And thanks for coming. All right. That's easy. <laughs>